Welcome to iPad Pros, the show all about using your iPad to be productive and get work done. I'm Tim Chen, host of the show. This episode is sponsored by Agenda 14. Learn more at agenda.com. What I use the touch part for on iPad is a couple of different things. The first thing is to actually touch my uh, my software because what these software apps are, these plugins are emulations of real hardware. So they have little dials and they have like little screws, you know, uh, they're trying to look exactly like what the metal boxes look like in real life. And so um, getting to be able to like touch that and touch the controls and modify the controls with your fingers and uh, uh, almost like a di- dial in real life, um, that is a very unique experience for a music producer to be able to do where on the, the cause, uh, for decades we've just been used to um, if you didn't have access to that expensive hardware just uh, keyboard and mouse that's all you've been doing just keyboard and mouse everything just mouse touch mouse touch mouse touch everything and you actually became kind of distant away from the music and almost the creativity and and the music and between the brain kind of like severed a little bit with the mouse over the years people became fatigued welcome back to our episode of iPad Pros In this episode, we are joined by the music producer known as Vortex. We go in-depth on why the iPad is the perfect tool for a music producer and how he does all of his production work from the iPad. I learned a ton in this discussion and can't wait to start using some of the new plugins and tools for the iPad that I didn't know even existed. You may be wondering why this episode is releasing on a Tuesday rather than the traditional Thursday. Well, I'm pleased to share that the latest version of Agenda is now available. Agenda 14 adds a really smart autocomplete system, an incredible new tagging system, backlinks that makes working with multiple related notes super easy, editable attachments, lines and grids for Apple Pencil sketches, and more. I'll be diving into all of these awesome new features later on in this episode. Download Agenda 14 right now in the App Store. Well, without further ado, here's my interview with Vortex. Enjoy. Welcome to the podcast, Vortex. Can you first introduce yourself and broadly how you use the iPad? Sure thing. Uh, thanks for first of all, thanks for having me on here, Tim. Uh, yeah, I've been. Um, so I'm a. My name is. Well, I go by the pseudonym of Vortex. That's my uh, both my gamer tag and my producer tag. Real name is Jeffrey, but everybody seems to seems to like to call me Vortex or just V at this point. Okay. Uh, yep. some, some of my best friends, but Vortex is really what people know me as. And yeah, yeah. And so I'm a music producer. I've been producing uh, music since about 2013. It's where it's when I started actually learning uh, about music production. And we'll get into that uh, origin story a little bit later if you'd like. Uh, that's how I found the iPad is through actual uh, music. <laughs> but um, what uh, what I do is I run uh, the U- the YouTube channel and sample pack label called Mobile Music Pro, uh, mobilemusicpro.com. And what I do is I try to provide content and resources for iOS music producers. So specif- so music producers, but specifically uh, people m- using the iPad and the iPhone to produce music. So that can include all sorts of tools and, uh, th- and things and guides, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, tools and guides and other things as well. So uh, really, just anything I can do to kind of serve the producer community and uh, trying to do it, though, specifically uh, for iOS. Excellent. And what's your current iPad setup these days? Sure. So uh, so it's funny. You know, I actually have a, um, a video. Uh, I have a, an origin video <laughs> or, or one of my videos I have on my uh, channel that actually goes through and... Um, I think it's actually the uh, the top five reasons why um, iOS music production is the future, actually, on that video. And I have a couple images where I actually go through my my studio setups over the years. And it started out with just an iPad on a box, <laughs> like an iPad mini. <laughs> I think it was. That was my first iPad, just iPad mini on a box yeah. and uh, some kind of crappy headphones. And then it evolved over the years. I got like five or six pictures uh, over the years. But now uh, I do have a full-on uh, studio uh, desk, a studio music desk that was designed to have. Uh, it's got multiple levels on there designed to have uh, speakers on there. I don't know if you can see it behind me i wish we could do video but you can't so uh but i do have it uh there behind me and because this is where i record everything is inside of uh, my studio here which is just a spare bedroom in my house and so for my setup i have uh you know i have everything hooked up to my ipad i can i treat it as a a full computing device so i have um basically everything but the kitchen sink (laughs) everything but uh, another external monitor so what i have is i have uh, multiple um input devices so i have my music keyboard and then i have my pad controller for doing drums uh so those that's my peripherals i have Mm -hmm. and then I have a um, uh, multiple um, multiple uh, innovation controllers so that I can control and do real time. Uh, 
producing or sorry uh real-time performances uh of, of various music and things like that those are i recommend the launchpad app that's what i use with with the hardware so it's very okay. very great app to use with the hardware so i have my hardware connected to that and then also i have a full-on um audio interface uh focus 2i2 hooked up there uh which is also feeding going into a uh, yamaha mixer so that i can have uh, an additional device hooked up, which which is my Ka- uh, Korg Chaos Pad. So it's kind of like a synthesizer, kind of like an effect uh, device. So all of that is running through the mixer, which is then running all the way uh, out through uh, via USB to my i iP- or to my laptop, which I then use to uh, either record or stream out there uh, via Restream.io to YouTube or to Twitch.tv or wherever I, wherever I'd like. But that what what that allows me to do is capture all the audio and video from my iPad and um, a um, a um, all my other devices and my camera all at one time there. Gotcha. And are you using any kind of Thunderbolt hub to make all of that happen? Actually, no. It's all just uh, USB, believe it or not. Uh, okay. just, just USB and standard audio cables because I have the um, – how it works is I have uh, every, the, everything connected to a USB hub, which includes um, um, my, my iPad itself, all of my USB peripherals, and the mixer, which then goes out to my uh, laptop. Okay. So, and USB-C is kind of what makes all that happen. Eligibly. Absolutely. So the USB-C port, and of course, I was doing that with Lightning. I was doing that with a Lightning adapter because what you do, of course, is get a uh, an adapter on the iPad that allows you to have a bunch more additional connections yep. like a USB, USB-C, and so or USB and, and audio and other things. And so I have the I uh, was use, running the Lightning with the with the other uh, 2015 iPad Pro that I had before for a couple of years. Well, actually, three or four years, I think. And then now I'm running the 2018 iPad Pro uh, one terabyte, and so that's the USB-C. So it's basically the same setup but i had to switch the adapter there gotcha yeah something i struggled with uh, until thunderbolt came out was getting a good headphone jack for ipad because it seemed that all the USB-C enabled ones just were very flaky uh but the thunderbolt uh dock i have is just super reliable with all that and maybe it's also the fact that i never had a powered externally powered USB-C hub and maybe those are a better quality perhaps as far as what it can do um you'd be be, be surprised uh i mean just a standard USB-C peripheral uh, multi-peripheral de- uh, device uh, or multi-peripheral adapter uh man i have one that ha- that can have everything in the kitchen sink on there it's got like two or three usb ports an audio port and a bunch of stuff uh so actually uh, and they and with USB-C they're very reliable um and i use both uh, uh sometimes i use the apple adapter when i'm out and about and sometimes yeah. i use a, a third a third party but but the usb c has been really you. Rock solid, yeah. Okay, USB-C that's good to hear. Yeah, because yeah, that was. I went through a couple USB Cs that were bus powered and just I wasn't happy until I got. Oh, so as far as a USB thing. port, yeah, a USB sorry, a USB hub. So a USB yeah. hub, I uh, definitely recommend the powered. Got to have powered uh, USB hub for there, and gotcha. I use the anchor. Okay. I really recommend the Anchor brand. Uh, it's been so solid, and I've uh, been using it for years. And I, I, I have like a twelve port uh, plus ports on there, at least twelve ports on there that I do, at least ten anyway, because I have so many peripherals, USB peripherals yeah. for making music connected to that. Um, so I have the, the Anchor USB, and definitely recommend that the Anchor USB, uh, any 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 Anchor um, powered USB. Def- uh, adapter or usb hub should work really really gotcha. well the really rocks out they're like designed i think for for corporate for business and stuff for in the office and the laptop you're using the stream what you're doing and that's just a limitation of ipad os that does enable you to do your creation work while streaming you can only do kind of one thing at a time as far as your audio outputs is well, that right well with the I, well, with the ipad you have to be able to um because there's no uh, let's see. So there's no app that allows me to be able to do to stream the audio and the video uh, from from the iPad and my microphone and my USB camera. Yeah. There's no streaming software that allows me to do that within just the iPad itself. Right. So I have to use uh, OB. So I use OBS okay. uh, to gotcha. combine all of that together into nice one screen, which includes the iPad um, and then my. Uh, uh, USB camera uh, as well, my HD facing USB camera. Yeah, hopefully we'll get there one day. And uh, I mean, it'd be yeah. nice to be able to do it from the iPad. But what's also great, though, is that the iPad doesn't have to work any extra too much extra harder for that. So I actually True. kind of yeah. save some resources as opposed to using like an additional app because music production, uh, you, you can talk to any music producer or any video editor, like video editor, vi- video editing, music production and video games like that is what really, really, really takes the power uh, from any device. It, that's what demands. It's what kind of drives the whole CPU and GPU market is, is the demand for those particular applications. So it, you can talk to any music producer and they'll tell you that they, they need every last little ounce of power uh that we can that we can muster for sure yeah i mean if apple can figure out how to fully support that new studio display with a camera that means they could potentially also in that work figure out how to deal with external cameras on an ipad for kind of that kind of thing you're doing 
Absolutely, and and they're they're now putting the A13 chips into the into the monitors, which is pretty which is pretty intense. They're now putting like literally um, um, uh, computing grade CPUs in the monitors. So you got to yeah. think they have a, a an idea, a couple of ideas for the future. They're, they're not, they wouldn't just put that in there for no reason. Nope. So, uh, question for you. You have the 16 gigabyte uh, RAM model of the iPad, as do I, the one terabyte edition or greater. Anything pushing uh, the RAM? Uh, have you seen any music apps that, that really... Is there any setup where you'd be running a bunch of plugins and you know this is something that you can only do because of all that RAM in that iPad? Sure. So I actually have the 2018 iPad Pro uh, one terabyte. So that means I have six gigabyte of RAM, where the rest of the 2018 models had four gigabyte. Oh, of RAM. But that's I have right. Six because, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I got I got the one terabyte, and uh, uh, boy, I would love to to have me one of those M1s at some point. I'm gonna definitely <laughs> be saving up and getting one at some point for sure. Um, either an M1 or maybe I might skip the M1 and, and get to the M1 Pro that they're probably gonna announce in the next iPad Pro because uh, they just put M1s in the regular old iPad Airs. So yep. uh, or who knows M2s, what they're gonna uh, put? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, I imagine the, the M2. Thermal, the Thermal limit might uh, may make uh, the iPads always an M chip because you don't want to put a fan in those things. Out, yeah, that makes sense. Like all the um, M1 Pros, those have a little fan in the MacBooks, right? So the iPad Pros, I haven't ever heard a fan. I don't know. I don't believe they have fans in the MacBook. Not Pro. To my, oh, sorry, in the MacBooks. Yeah, I actually don't have a, a Mac, just the iPads. Yeah, so, so I, I think I, yeah, I don't, you I don't know if they have more the cooling. I think so. You would, you would, but, you would, but yeah. I, it'd be. So, but hey, they they did put the M. They're sticking the M1s in there in the they iPad. Are. So there's yeah. no reason why I don't think they they might be able to stick an M2 because that was the whole reason why they went with the M uh, architecture, right? To be able to uh, support low power. The whole M ar- architecture was built and derived from uh, the, the iPad itself. So Yeah, and it'll um, be interesting to see if effort. the M2 maybe jumps it up to 32 gigs as a top end uh, to support you know, a Mac Mini that you might want more RAM in that thing, and maybe that benefits the iPad as well. You bet. You bet. I believe that Apple definitely has a plan to uh, bring together their mobile devices and their desktop devices more and more and more seamlessly uh, over time, for sure. But as far as getting back to your original question, yeah. um, ha- have I seen any uh, apps, music apps that really utilize 16 gigabytes of RAM? And, and I get questions from this from my own music community as well, of course, because you know they're like, should we get this? Like, can we utilize this? This is much RAM. <laughs> and and basically, what it boils down to is when it comes to music produ- production, what kind of matters even more than RAM is the CPU. Like, the CPU is what matters the most for music production. So okay. because we're, we're we're processing audio in real time with all with running all sorts of plugins and uh and doing that uh really is actually down boils down more to the CPU. You got to have some RAM, yeah. but really like I have like 4 to 6 gig RAM is actually almost pretty much enough to do to do most things. So uh, when it comes to uh 16 gig RAM, there's also an interesting side note here too that the uh the iOS doesn't actually allow a, an app to have more than 5 gigabyte of RAM per I app. Think, so it doesn't actually Well, I think that, and that they might have and that a, might be um, raised eventually, I'm sure. Developers can request a Yes. Uh, an addition, an addition up to twelve gigabytes of RAM, I believe, is the new topic. Yes, so yeah. that, that that definitely has been that has been changed recently. So that's great, and 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 I and I and I called, I, I made a call for that. Everybody was all up in arms about the five. I'm like, they're going to raise this yeah. at some point, of course. I mean, you know, and even if they they didn't, um, you know, like it, it just it just makes sense uh, does, that, yeah. that when we have more and more RAM, that we're going to, the apps are going to demand more and more. So basically, what I try, what I tell people is that really the only way, kind of no matter what you're doing, to utilize sixteen gigs of RAM is kind of only two ways: either a video game game or or um just mad mad multitasking just tons of multitasking just tons of apps like you your workflow demands like 12 you know 14 16 apps open at once and if you really do need to switch between all of those and and uh apps all the time constantly that is where i'd recommend the 16 gig ramp to really to crazy multitasking the yeah. single app thing i've heard is many many layers and some kind of drawing app could push it that high but i'm not sure the layers concept works in music like if you have a i don't know does 500 does 500 tracks in a single music project is that a ram thing or is that a cpu thing yeah so that's definitely a ram thing so so definitely ram comes into play at some point for sure and so what it comes where it comes into play is is how many tracks you can have and how many plugins you can you can actually have but it doesn't tell you how many plugins you can run right because if you 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 could add a bunch of plugins but no if you don't have the cpu power when you click play if you don't have the cpu when you click play it's just gonna sound like and yeah. it's just going to break up and, and, and not play. So um, the RAM does come into play for sure, and it does help with adding many tracks, but we could already, with six gigabyte of RAM, we could already kind of have hundreds of audio tracks. Yeah. Like So it's already it was already kind of crazy with the RAM. Really, what, what I was waiting for, and what I'm so glad that Apple did is put that M1 in there, what I was waiting for was the CPU bump. Gotcha. Was the, 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 the CPU bump. And that is what we got with the M1. That's why I was so, so, so happy about that and wrote about it in a blog post and, you know, to let the music producer community know, the, music, the whole music production community know that Apple is kind of 
to put the desktop on watch a little bit by putting the M1 into the iPad. It, yeah, they're now, it's uh, now in the air as the well. World. Yep, they, they're signaling to the world that they want these mobile devices to be just as fast as desktops or are real close and for sure the fastest mobile devices on the planet. Like, yeah. They don't want anybody competing. And so uh, that is why I can't recommend, for example, like any type of Android device for music production because their real-time audio is atrocious. They simply weren't designed for it. And so the ecosystem is so fragmented that you'll never, you're never going to ever be able to get the drivers that you need um, straight from Google to be able to get that real-time audio processing down. So with Apple, the, 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 the latency is just ridiculous. Ridiculously low. I mean, you can do a, you can do anything on the desktop with audio production. You can do on 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 the iPad, and that is an incredible, incredible feat and an incredible That's task. Part of the foundation of iOS and iPad OS bringing over when they said, "Oh, this is Mac on a mobile device back in 2007." What they meant by that is they're bringing over those like core audio things that was back uh, even on early iPads. You could hook up a camera connection kit, and there was core audio that supported stuff that no one would ever really um, you'd think would need back then, but it was there. And uh, the absolutely. Apple, yeah. that's what's amazing is that Apple cares about creatives. Apple cares about music producers like to the point where they created uh, an AUV3 standard for the iOS. So what that means is on the desktop, you have these these plugins uh, for, for uh, music producers called called VSTs and audio units. And what they are, there's basically plugins. And it's a plugin standard called audio unit and VST. And on, on iOS, we didn't have that for the long time. So for the longest time, so you uh, every app had to be independent. But when they created that AUV3 standard, which is basically a modification of the AU standard on the desktop, when Apple created that specifically for iOS, we could now mirror the the same functionality and user experience of the desktop on the iOS. And what that means is that we could have a digital audio workstation like Cubase or what we call Cubase on the, on the iPad. We could have a, a DAW open and have a, run a bunch of different plugins inside of it um, right within the app itself and uh, with it within the DAW itself. And so that is where you can really start um, adding, getting, get, needing the CPU is when you start adding more and more and more plugins. But we couldn't do that before AUV3. We could only use the plugins that were already built into the DAW, already built into the yeah. app. But with this new standard that Apple created, and supports still to this day and is always improving we can now have we can now bring any any single music app uh, inside of our DAW which includes you know effects and, and instruments and all that good stuff so it's really great excellent yeah now something I didn't hear you mention in your setup um, uh, portion here is do you use a QWERTY keyboard and an external trackpad or mouse uh, with your iPad yeah, so f because my iPad mostly kind of uh, lives in the studio because I really don't, I really don't go that, whole, I really don't travel that much and yeah. go to that many places. So for me, actually, it's kind of funny. Like I just, you know, I love, love, love the iPad and support the iPad and absolutely uh, uh, praise and herald the portability of it. But I just don't actually use the portability part. Uh, I just love it because of the simplicity of the operating system and um, uh, and the device itself, um, the sleekness of the device. Because for example, on the desktop to download and start making start, start making music, you have to download the, and pay huge amounts of money for the software. Then you have to configure the drivers. Then you have to configure all these additional options within the DAW itself. And we're, um, and, and we're with on iOS, you just download it and Add a track. That's it. You go to the app store. You type in Cubases. You click download, and it and you, you open it up, and that's it. You're ready to start making music. And so that type of user experience uh, that still exists today on the iPad is really what I, why a big reason, a big part of what attracted me to the iPad uh, for making music, and a big reason why I um, I try to you know kind of kind of trying to create a movement here uh, for for uh, to get music producers aware and people aware that you can actually produce full time professional like real actual professional music right on your own iOS right on your own iPhone or, iPhone or iPad. So um, it, it's an incredible thing that we have. And so I have to continue to, to, to try to remind people of this because people don't know the power of what you can do on the iPad yet. They just don't know. Yeah. Um, my question, uh, come back to, um, do you use like an external QWERTY keyboard and like- Oh, a sorry, sorry about that. that. Yes, yeah, yeah. I, got a, I got a little off, okay. off the track there because, uh, and and that brings it around. So for example, um, w w uh, because because my iPad does stay in the studio for the most part, what I actually do is I abs absolutely use a uh, USB uh, QWERTY keyboard, a okay. little a little mini one, a little uh, small one, and then a, a mouse for sure because I personally am a mouse and keyboard guy. I yeah. mean, I'm, I'm 40 years old pretty much, so I grew up with a mouse and a keyboard. This is what I know. So what, but what I love about the touch, what I use the touch part for on iPad is a couple different things. The first thing is, 
is to actually touch my uh, my software because what these software apps are, these plugins are emulations of real hardware. So they have little dials and they have like little screws, you know, uh, they're trying to look exactly like what the metal boxes look like in yeah. real life. And so um, getting to be able to like touch that and touch the controls and modify the controls with your fingers and uh, uh, almost like a, di- a dial in real life, mm-hmm. um, that is a very unique experience for a music producer to be able to do where on the, because the, uh, f- for decades we've just been used to um, if you didn't have access to that expensive hardware, just uh, keyboard and mouse. That's all you've been doing. Just keyboard and mouse, everything. Just mouse touch, mouse touch, mouse touch, everything. And you actually became kind of distant yeah. away from the music. And almost the creativity and uh, and the music and between the brain uh, kind of like severed a little bit with the mouse over the years. People became fatigued. And so um, every good music producer knows that you got to have hardware. And so being able to touch it, uh, actually touch these plugins and touch the dials, that is a truly amazing experience. And I try to remind people of that as well, um, that is possible on the iPad. So I do use a keyboard and mouse um, just, you know, to move around and everything like that. But when it comes to actually um, zooming in and modif- and, and uh, modifying the plugins and touching the plugins, that is a great, great user experience because you have that high, great definition display, great graphics, and then real-time touch. It's so smooth. It's just a really great experience. Do you use like a hoverbar duo or any kind of stand to put your iPad at more ergonomic heights for you or? Absolutely, absolutely. I, I have, so I definitely have, I forget the name of it, but it's like an $80 <laughs> metal, like real good stand. Uh, I actually have all the hardware that I use. Uh, you can find at mobilemusicpro.com slash gear, uh, mobilemusicpro.com slash gear that has all the stuff that I have in my actual studio, including uh, this um, this iPad holder. And so I definitely have to do that because if I look down, then, you know, it hurts my neck yeah. like crazy. So so on my desktop, I have I definitely have monitor stands on all my desks uh, to prop up the, the monitors. And then for the iPad, uh, I, I was thinking, should I use a monitor stand or should I just get like an iPad stand? And the iPad stand has been working fantastic. Excellent. Yeah. What kind of music do you actually create? So, uh, uh, as a music producer, like if you if you <laughs> if you call yourself a music producer, um, usually you you can kind of create almost anything. You, the mm-hmm. idea is to uh, uh, develop the artist's vision, right? So, whatever the artist is coming to you with, whether that's a rock uh, artist or a hip hop artist or whatever they're doing, or if it's just uh, instruments or if it's vocals, you kind of try to serve the artist and try to bring the vision uh, together, and that's kind of what a producer's job is. But uh, but basically, um, what kind of music do I actually like producing? All sorts of kinds. I really like. You know, pop, EDM, rock, uh, uh, you know, uh, and, and all of the subgenres of all of those uh, there within hip hop, of course, uh, many different versions of hip hop. So, uh, you know, I lived through the 90s. So, of course, hip hop yeah. is going to be part, part of my part of my blood. Uh, so but uh, it's um, just a huge variety. And that's what I teach too on the channel is I teach you like actually how to produce music. So I don't actually do too many genre based stuff because okay. the principles I'm trying to teach uh, allow you to kind of create any kind of music. Because once you learn like a lot of the fundamentals like music theory and, and drum patterns yeah. and some of the fundament and chords you know some of some of the fundamental stuff you can make any kind of music and so i encourage uh, my audience to make as many kinds of music as possible so on the channel I, I teach a variety of different genres in addition to the actual fundamental principles that allow you to make anything that you'd like so um cubase is three that's kind of the big app in this space and it's a very pro level app and you'll see that with its kind of scary interface that when i first looked at it i was uh, um a bit uh, put off by it, to say the least. <laughs> really? Uh, interesting. Uh, interesting. What are your suggestions for those kind of getting started with Cubasis and, you know, understanding this user interface they've come up with? And it, and it's funny you mention that because, like, if you look at Q, the, the desktop version called Cubase, you'd be even more scared. Tim, I, I think you would run away. Like it's if you think that that looks because I tell you what the the Q basis uh, UI looks so simple and pretty uh, compared to that 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 insane massive Q base. Yeah, when you get a yeah. chance, Google what Q base looks like compared to Q basis. <laughs> but uh, uh, so Q ba- uh, Q basis, um, I would say that the UI is actually pretty slick because what it does is it, it uh, employs one of those UIs that's kind of uh, only show you what you need uh, at the moment, so everything hides away. Okay, and so uh, a Garage Band kind of. Does does this a little bit too, um, but but not even almost to the extent that that uh, Cubasis does, because they allow a lot of things on the screen at once. So you can see your tracks all at once with the mixer, or you can see your tracks all at once with a plugin and a and a, a virtual keyboard, and so you can see all this uh, on the screen at once. But everything is very very actually um, straightforward. So you want to add a track, you just click add track. Uh, you want to add a plugin, go to plugins, add plugin. So you'd be surprised compared to a standard DAW, a standard music production software, we call what we call a digital audio workstation. You'd be very surprised at how simplistic the user interface is compared to a lot of that stuff um but uh what i would recommend for sure of course is uh check out the website because you know this is what we teach so we have guides and videos and all that good stuff on there and i'm 
actually going to be releasing a course at some point this year. Uh, if I get around to it, I've been trying so hard, but oh my gosh, <laughs> everything yeah. keeps getting in the way. But um, for sure, I recommend... Um, uh, checking out all of our videos and checking out all our guides. Our, we have a completely free guide called the Beginner's Guide to Cubasis 3. And in there, we definitely try to break down and explain uh, all the main user interface elements. And the guide itself, I think, is only like 30 pages, 30, 30 40 pages. So it's, it's it's pretty simple and straightforward. If you download that, I think, uh, and read that, you'll definitely have a really good idea of where to, where to get started with, with the software. As you're collaborating with artists, is the mobile form factor for the iPad something... Of value, do you like rip it? You do you like yank it out of its um, studio setup and bring it to where the artist is in the recording booth and kind of show you what's going on? Is that something that happens? Yeah, so it's actually funny because the iPad uh, is used for so, so, so many things that pe um, people would just assume that it, it couldn't be used for actual full music production device because you'll find iPads used all the time to just display lyrics, right, or to display uh, to display music pages for for in uh, for, in um, for musicians to play. Yeah, it's used in all that, and it's used a lot in recording studios for like temporary uh, recording setups, um, or or and a lot of podcasters use it. So you, you, all of these different uses, right? And um, but you wouldn't think that you can actually produce the whole song, the whole song on the actual iPad, but you can. Um, so uh, it's fun. It's kind of funny because right now, <clears throat> similar to the um, similar to actually computers uh, when they were first coming up in the nineties, they're kind of considered a toy, right? So uh, because people don't understand it, so they kind of consider it either cheating or they consider it a toy. So for the vast majority of people right now, uh, at least music producers, they don't even know uh, that you can produce music on the iPad. And, and if you tell them that you make a uh, you produce a track on the iPad that, uh, that sounds professional, they wouldn't believe you. They're like, no, you, you made that in GarageBand or you made that on Pro Tools mm -hmm. or you know you made that on somewhere else. Um, but hey, GarageBand exists on the iPad and. Uh, you can make some amazing stuff, and I think more and more artists would be actually surprised how many songs you hear on the radio are actually uh, started in GarageBand. So I think that's going to be a big movement, too, as artists start to learn about the iPad more. Uh, they're going to just start using the iPad, uh, GarageBand on the iPad. Um, but right now, it's a little bit, so it's a little bit of a joke to, 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 to producers and stuff. They definitely laugh. They're like, what, what is that? You know. But uh, once they hear what you can make, and once they see the tools in actual production, in play, once they see them being used in real time, they're all blown away. Every time, they cannot cannot believe it jaws drop every single time and there's a person i recommend watching called uh, henny the business and he's a music grammy award-winning music producer and he has a lot of videos on the, his channel where he introduces uh, other producers and artists to the ipad and they, every time they're just like no way no way they don't believe it they just can't believe it but this is a fully you know fully m1 computing device here so you can actually do a lot more than, than you might think very cool and as far as the apple pencil is that a tool that you find value in, uh, you know, manipulating these smaller touch points in Cubasis 3? So I absolutely know a, a bunch of people that use the and swear by the Apple Pencil, especially for 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 um, uh, using Cubasis 3 and modifying the, the piano roll and those, mm -hmm. those notes, you know, moving notes around. So there's absolutely a, a few people that swear by it that I know for sure that love it. But me personally, I, re I, I just like the mouse. I don't like, the, I don't want to hold my, my, I don't like yeah. the posturing of holding my hand up there. So I just like, to, you know, like I said, <clears throat> I'm old school, right? So I just I'm just used to having my hand uh, right on the desk with the mouse, and so yeah, the mouse really was a game changer when we could add a trackpad or a mouse. It is, yeah. To this day, like there's a reason why we still use it for video games. Yeah, it's the ultimate. I mean, competitive video games where millions and millions and millions of dollars are on the line. Um, people use the mouse and keyboard, and that is because of its. Uh, laser focused, you know, accuracy, laser accuracy, perfect accuracy, and the ability to move it around. And you, so far, we just have not invented uh, something that can be more accurate in real time from the brain to the screen than the mouse. Does Cubasis do any modifications for iPad OS with the mouse? Like, does is there magnetized icons in any way? Or so, uh, let's see. So uh, the, uh, the 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 actual the app Cubasis is not optimized for. The mouse per se, but they did uh, release recently release um, keyboard shortcuts. Oh, so cool. they now support the keyboard. So that's really cool because just like on the on the desktop, you can hit the space bar to hit play and stop. And you'll find producers do that all the time. We you know oh, we, yeah. we, we get the thumb on the space bar so that we can uh, stop it and then modify some play, stop it, modify. And so uh, that was really a game changer to be able to support keyboard shortcuts. And I'm super glad that they that they did that. Uh, I believe they will eventually have more enhanced mouse functionality, specifically the ability to to use the mouse wheel. Because right now you cannot use the mouse wheel mm. uh in cubasis yeah so that's that's definitely a little strange so I'll, every time i have to scroll anywhere i have to scroll with my fingers does uh have you tried a magic trackpad would scrolling work on that thing 
Or is it the same situation? So, uh, so no, it's the same thing. So when, okay. when you when you like when you actually like zoom or pinch or anything like that, it's the same thing. The computer understands it the same as, okay. as a mouse wheel. Gotcha. Okay, yeah. wasn't sure. And then, um, do you have any special buttons triggered uh, with that mouse? Is it like a five on mouse where you can have custom things? I don't know. The settings app has some like weird things you can like set mouse triggers to. You know, I was so surprised at uh, how well the iPad integrated mouse. Be, the mouse because yeah. the, into the into the into the OS because I definitely have some gestures bind to my keys. So what I do is uh, the right mouse button is is the zoom out mm-hmm. so that um, I can see all my apps at once, and then um, I have the middle button as the home button, which just makes me go right home, uh, right to the home screen. Yeah, and then I have the, the 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 thumb button on the left bring up my dock. Okay, very cool. And so with just those three things, and of course your regular mouse click, uh, with just those three things, I can zoom around the iPad so fast, way faster than anybody with a regular, uh, with like just using their fingers. Yeah, and, and you can double kind of click the home button to get yeah. multitasking. Yeah, and so people, I kind of surprise some people on the live streams. They're like, "How do you get around iOS so fast?" Because you know, I'll just like I'll zoom out, pick an app, then do a dock, uh, br- then bring that I- to do a dual screen, and then you know, I kind of move around a little fast. And people are like, "How the heck?" Uh, but it's because of the mouse. This episode is sponsored by Agenda, which just rolled out version fourteen. In this quick break, I want to share a little bit about their latest release, Agenda 14. For those that want to really deep dive into Agenda, I'd encourage you to go back and listen to episode 48 of this podcast, where I spoke with Drew McCormack, the co-founder of Agenda. There you can hear how their approach to notes is a bit different from the other tools you may have used. So on to Agenda 14. New in this update is the ability to hide old projects, which really has cleaned up my sidebar to make me more focused on what I'm actually working on. Simply click on the little clock icon in the sidebar to show or hide projects based on use. Auto completion is finally done right with Agenda 14. Simply hit the backslash to enter this mode and start typing a few letters like DAT to be shown a bunch of auto completion date options. There is even auto complete for actions, like assigning a date to a current note or inserting text from one of your templates. Another really nice change is when you add a link to an agenda note inside another agenda note, that link note will appear in a related notes list in the sidebar, and you only have to put the link in one of the two notes, and when you tap on the related note, you can instantly pop over to the other note and go in the sidebar and tap on that original note to be brought back to where you were. It is super clever and super handy and makes working with multiple notes all related to each other super easy. This works not with just one or two notes, but a bunch of notes, so you can have them all show up in that sidebar to be tapping between them and working with all these notes simultaneously. Now with Agenda 14, you can finally mark up PDFs within Agenda. In previous versions, attachments could live in the notes, but you need to edit them externally. It's so nice having this all within Agenda finally. Another great addition is when you sketch something with the Apple Pencil, you have the ability to select a few different backgrounds, including lines and closed lines, which are similar to wide-ruled and college-ruled notebooks, as well as grid or fine grid background. You can even hot-swap between backgrounds if you need to go back and forth in the same note. This is something I found incredibly useful, as I really need anchor points like a line or grid to keep my handwritten notes looking halfway decent. Another big feature is a brand new powerful tagging system that is having me rethink how I organize my notes in Agenda. Tags now have the ability to be color-coded, plus you can even have spaces in your tag. For instance, top priority can be a tag without cramming that together as one word, as I've often done in Agenda and other apps that have that requirement of having tags needing to be a single word. You can also utilize your tags in some really cool new ways. The new Manage Tags window shows just how powerful this new system is. Quickly get into that by hitting Option Command Shift T or by tapping Manage Tags after tapping any tag. Here in the Manage Tags screen, you can see a list of all of your tags, create new tags, search for tags, and best of all, create a new smart overview for a certain tag. These smart overviews are pinned to the top of your sidebar along with on the agenda and your today view. This smart overview will pull in all notes with that tag across all projects into a single view. Just like everything in Agenda, this new smart overview has its own unique link, so you can link to it from other apps. Finally, 
they've added a really cool subscription option. One of my favorite agenda things is their business model of pay for agenda premium to get all existing agenda premium features, plus whatever comes out in the next 12 months. With Agenda 14, they are building on top of this with a new subscription for those that don't want the hassle of upgrading every year. The big benefit with opting for the subscription version of Agenda is it is 15% cheaper than the standard Agenda Premium. And just like the standard Agenda Premium, even if you cancel your subscription, you will keep all of the Agenda Premium features released before and while you had an active subscription. So that's what's new in Agenda 14. To learn more, go to Agenda.com and download Agenda 14 today for free from the App Store. My thanks again to Agenda for sponsoring this episode of IPA Pros. Learn more at Agenda.com. So you mentioned the audio plugin scene is really shaping up on iPad OS. Um, what, what's the uh, extension called, the plugin called again? The so the um the actual standard is called the extension standard is called AUV three. Okay, yeah, and so you're seeing a healthy market of developers porting the Mac versions of those to the App Store, and that's been a good experience so far. Absolutely, and that that's actually growing bigger and bigger because uh, it started out with, and there still is a huge independent developer scene. I mean, they're actually rivaling what the big what the big guys are doing in a lot of ways. Um, you'd be very surprised how many amazing plugins come from one single uh, uh, developer studios. But uh, we do absolutely have now the big boys coming in, which includes big companies like FabFilter and IK Multimedia and Roland. And so on. These guys are bringing their their mainstay, their main software that 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 sells on desktop over to iOS. And what they say is, of course, they say works on iOS, uh, Windows, and uh, iPad. And so it's kind of becoming a thing now where they got to make their plugins work on the iPad as well, and um, uh, or and maybe not all the time on the iPhone, mm-hmm. but for sure at least the iPad. <laughs> for sure and at least the iPad because they the know that's where developers it's are they opting for a subscription where you subscribe and you get it in all the platforms, or are they doing the app purchase model for iPad. Yep. So it's a bit of an interesting thing. Uh, some apps in the early days were starting out with a subscription. That's kind of more gone by the wayside now, and it's more just the upfront purchase uh, and sometimes free with in-app purchases. Okay. And so that's kind of the biggest thing. But there's also now a newer uh, standard that people are adopting, which is where you pay once um, and you get the app forever, but uh, in order to uh, get new updates, you have to pay uh, another fee, another year, uh, annual fee. So it's kind of like a subscription, but you get to keep the app forever. Yeah. You just have to pay every year to get updates. To yeah, it's app. kind of what Agenda kind of pioneered with their app. Uh, I think they were one of the first to do that. Yep, and so we're, we're starting to see that seep in now into the audio app world. That's very cool. And how's reliability been of the plugin? Something I've noticed at least in the ones I've tried, is they sound great while I'm live, you know, doing stuff in Fair. I am I'm using a, a plug in. Then when I hit the export button, uh, sometimes it just doesn't work entirely as it should, and I'll lose a track or something like that. Sure, yeah, it absolutely depends on the software because when it comes to software, software development is a complex thing, and it really does separate the men from the boys, uh, so to speak, because uh, you, people will be able to come together in communities and, and recommend what is actually the best because there's so many things that parade around, you know, it's trying to be the best. So uh, unfortunately there is a, uh, because uh, Apple development is so easy to get into um, and so prevalent, uh, you're going to actually find uh, a lot of crappy apps out there, but the good ones definitely do uh, seep to the top. So um, I have had experience with some apps, some music apps and some music plugin apps specifically that take a lot of latency, that take a lot of CPU power and therefore have a lot of latency. Definitely seen some of those and I've definitely seen some that crash more than others for sure. Um, but there absolutely is a mainstay of stable apps that people use and has been using for years, including myself. Uh, for example, like uh, those FabFilter apps mm-hmm. and FAC apps, uh, Fred, uh, Fred Anton Cor- Corvest, uh, and a couple uh, some Bleas, B-L-E-A-S-S apps. So I can name a few companies. And uh, these, these apps have been in 100% reliable, 100% stable and do not crash. But there is ton, there is a bunch of plugins out there that, that crash because it's kind of a little bit of the Wild West yeah. uh, kind of ecosystem right now. Right. And what are the effects you're kind of looking for with the plugins you're working with most, you know, day to day? What are the some of the common plugins that you love and what kind of audio 
output do you get from that as a result of kind of using these? Sure. So, so there, like I said, we do have some amazing desktop plugins now on iOS, including FabFilter and something from IK Multimedia called Mixbox. Mixbox contains all of the desktop class, studio class quality uh, plugins that is used on your favorite television shows, movies, and productions on the radio, uh, including things like uh, the the. Uh, universal audio plugins like the 1176 and uh, a couple other ones as well. So some very standard, uh, industry standard stuff now can be found on the iPad. And when you use that industry standard stuff, you'll definitely find a quality boost. You'll definitely be able to hear the difference between um, some some of the cheaper apps and then so- something like FabFilter and then something like and something like this expensive app like Mixbox. Because Mixbox, I think it's like 80 bucks. I think it's an $80 app, um, which kind of pushes the, the limits there for, for app prices. Yeah. Uh, but that is part, that's part of the reason why iOS is so great is because the apps are, are absolutely so cheap and um but still uh w- with apps like that you can get a really really industry standard studio quality sound for sure because really when it comes to sound it's it's all in the the audio interface and the software right so uh, if you're running a, a good DAW like Cubasis and you have some industry standard plugins on there like FabFilter and Mixbox and um, you're using an industry standard audio interface like uh, Focusrite, uh, you will absolutely be able to record and output and print some fantastic, fantastic uh, uh, 48 quality, uh, 48K audio and you can even get up to 96 if you'd really like if you have the interface to do that but for the, for you know, you, you don't really need much more than 48. Yeah. Let's, like FabFilter, it's, is it filtering out frequencies to like provide a signature sound for that artist or what's the actual plugin doing in that case so for example fat filter is a suite of plugins so okay. uh, it comes with uh, uh an eq compressor de um, and uh, so, uh, uh, multi-band compression. So what those kind of things mean is that um, it comes with an EQ to be able to take out harsh frequencies. Uh, it, it comes with a, a compressor to be able to make it louder and be able to have a, a more crisper, uh, warmer signal. Mm-hmm. And then there's like then there's a de-esser which takes out all the the T's and the the S's and the T sounds from the th and the S. You know, it takes oh, out yeah. all of that. Um, so there's so, so some of these tools like that. That's why we call them. Indi- I should run that on uh, podcasts. It'd be great. <laughs> yeah, that, that's why we call them industry standard because like yeah. this is the stuff that that's just that's just used by everybody. That you, yeah, you just need the way I've known to do that just using production. pop filters, but that doesn't get everything. Absolutely, no, no. no. Uh, I mean, real. I mean, the, those those high end <laughs> those high end podcasts and those high end tech podcasts are absolutely edited in a DAW using these types of tools. Yeah. in post for sure. Very cool. Uh, so how is the e- like? Cubasis, is it a vibrant like update scene? Are they treating it like one of their primary apps that gets as much love as the desktop app or what's that kind of experience like? And so it's a great question because um, it absolutely does not get as much okay. love as their, ma- their main desktop DAW Cubase. Uh, there's a, a smaller, much smaller team on Cubasis. And I believe that a lot of those people are kind of part-time on the Cubasis team where they, they mostly do the Cubase stuff and then they're part-time that they, they do uh, the Cubasis. So I'm not sure actually how many full-time, I know they have must have at least one or two, but it's not as many as like the, the, the 30, 40, 50, 60 developers on do the Do they main, get a benefit uh, from the main app? Like when a big update comes out for the desktop app, do some of those features kind of eventually make their way down? Is it like a shared code base in any way? Um, uh, Unfortunately, no, not even, not even a little okay. bit. It's not even a little bit because see what and what and what's really telling is in the version number. So, for example, Cubasis is on version three, but the desktop Cubase that's on version twelve. Yeah. So they are so far ahead that we're just going to play catch up for years. We have years and years and years of catch up uh, to play uh, to get back up to get to the to desktop quality stuff. Um, but again, you can do ninety nine percent of the stuff, but there's definitely some one percent of stuff um, still still on those big uh, those big huge software programs, which is why they cost thousands of dollars uh, for that kind of software <laughs> so the experience of producing on ipad uh, can you describe just you, you've described already how amazing it is but if you're doing this on mac or windows are you hitting more friction points on those platforms with uh different things or what's the just experience of working on ipad versus mac and windows the biggest thing for me like like i think i said earlier is the simplicity mm-hmm. there's just zero configuration you just download the DAW, and then da- uh, and if you don't have to download plugins, if you don't want to, because it comes with plugins. But you just download the DAW, download some FabFilter plugins, and add a track, and and you're already off running. So for me, it's that it's that single experience, um, that one app 
uh, experience where you're just focused on that and really nothing else. And I heard you talk uh, with uh, um, Silva as well, uh, yeah. Fernando Silva, who has a great uh, YouTube channel. And he kind of t- went into this a little bit as well, where you just get this kind of one app experience with the iPad, where you're hyper focused on this one thing. And that the since uh, since music production is the only thing that I that I go deep on with the iPad. Um, it, it, I can definitely attest to that. That when you're when you have the DAW open and nothing else, you know, just that DAW, you're just hyper focused on what you're doing, which is making music, and in particular inside of that production process, you're either you know making a melody or you're um, adding an effect or you're you're mixing or you're mastering. And so um, all of the mixing tools, most of the mixing tools on the desktop are available, like I said, now on iOS. So uh, you can be hyper focused, um, have a super easy user experience, and still have industry class, industry standard tools at your disposal. So as far as what it's like for me, um, it's really it's just to me, it's so smooth. I guess I can't say any other word, but smooth because yeah. you turn on the iPad. It takes two seconds to turn on the iPad. You know how long it takes to boot up, like just a few seconds to boot up, open up Cubasis, boom, and I am in. I am ready to go. I've got my project on there. Uh, um, whatever I'm doing last, I'm ready to, to, to finish up and start doing right away. So um, for me, it's just a smooth experience of everything just works. The app opens up. I add a plugin. I add a track. I mix down and uh, mix down is, or export, and um, it's just super smooth, super smooth. And, um, as far as big projects, like what's the largest number of tracks you've worked in on a Cubasis three project on your iPad? And so it's interesting because we, you want to. Um, it, it's a little bit of an illusion too because uh, what you do it there's the, there's a process in music production called freezing tracks, and we do this so that um, the it can mix down. Um, to just plain audio, mm-hmm. whereas opposed to just MIDI or running all of these plugins in real time, we we hit the freeze button and that takes all that processing and just prints it to an audio uh, an audio wave where now the uh, the actual device doesn't have to work as hard. And so yeah. when you do that, it creates another track. So I have like I've had some projects that are only about. 20, 20, 30 tracks, but then a lot of them had were frozen, so that adds up now to like sixty or like fifty or sixty tracks. Yeah. But I definitely know uh, my average production. I think ranges between thirty and sixty tracks, and um, I think that uh, I've seen productions as much as a hundred plus tracks inside of Cubasis for sure. Uh, because once, especially if you're just working with audio, you can definitely do uh, pretty amazing things. But now with the M1, I mean, the sky's the limit, really. And a uh, screen size is that ever something you get? aggravated with like do you ever want an external display even if it is just mirroring to have those tracks in a bigger canvas yeah absolutely great question and i definitely definitely am all on board the 20 inch ipad <laughs> give, give, give me give me like a 21 inch ipad that would be fantastic it's as big as ipad as you can make them uh yeah. because as i get older uh the text is getting a little bit harder to read there on on the ipad i i that's why i always opt for the 12.9 because i, I want as big as uh experience as i can as i can have and yes you can expect Port it to a um, put put the or output it to an external monitor right now, but there you still got the bars on the side. Yeah, you do. and so because uh, they um, don't make four I, by three inch yeah. monitors of, of any exactly. quality that size. <laughs> exactly, and so perhaps maybe they can figure out that uh, to be able to do true output to like 1080p or native 1080p native 4K. Yeah. Well, I think once they get that, I'll probably definitely get an external monitor. Um, but until then, the, the screen size is actually not too bad. The 12.9 because it's about right here. It's about only a few inches, maybe six inches away from my face at any given time. Maybe like a, a, a half a foot to a foot. And you tend to focus time. on so. a select few tracks at a time and kind of move on, and you can scroll up and down as needed. Well. So with the like I was describing earlier with the interface, it's kind of slick because it only you can kind of show only what you need to show. So if you can hide the mixer if you're not if you're not worried about mixing, and you can hide uh, you know um, uh, the keyboard if you're not worried about actually inputting notes, and you can uh, double click on uh, audio and, and blow that up to just work on that audio. So you can actually um, work on many things at once within the DAW, or at least um, have many ideas at once that you're working with. Like for example, pitch this audio down, then um, then add an, another effect on the track underneath that, and then so you can just kind of go. One, to the, one idea to the next really fast. And that's another reason why I love the DAW and the interface because it's all about getting your ideas out as fast as possible when it comes to producing music. And I think that's the same when it comes to a lot of other different types of creative disciplines. But for sure with music, you got to get like you got to get that out fast with yeah. your, your your ideas, and so the quicker the ability to do that, uh, the better the uh, better the experience you'll have, and the better the track will be. And so I think Cubasis allows me to do that, where I can just move on from one idea to the next, one after another, really fast. For mixing, can you have an external hardware device with a bunch of knobs and do a live capture of what those knobs are doing and? correlate those to a track so you can be playing back a piece of music and track one i want to have that 
pay crescendoing and I turn this knob slowly over that period of time. Well, I have a different knob tied to a different track and kind of live mix it. Is that something that works today or is a reality? Absolutely. So absolutely. So that was only added, I think, a couple of years ago. Um, but uh, that is absolutely supported. Uh, Cubasis 3, what, what it's called is the HUI slash Mackie protocol. Okay. And uh, the Cubasis supports both of those. So that means that it supports any hardware mixer uh, that supports those protocols, which is basically every single hardware mixer. So you can have motorized mixers that definitely will will move the knob automatically for you. Like <laughs> it'll play back the yeah. the pl- the the movement that you made. Um, otherwise, if you don't have a motorized one, you can just get a standard cheap USB one as well. And but but you can still control it in real time. But like when it moves on the screen, it won't move your it won't move your device unless it's motorized. Right. But still, you can absolutely um absolutely uh. Use the HUI Mackie protocol to hook up any standard uh, class mixing um, hardware. And in addition to that, it supports uh, MIDI Learn, which means that you can uh, bind any action in the DAW to a USB controller as well. So, for example, um, I have buttons that binds creating a new track. I have buttons that binds adding a specific plugin and you can bind these actions and you can bind these uh, different tasks uh, to, to, to controllers. And there's controllers specifically with, 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 with these actions in mind that you can buy to make your workflow a little bit faster and speed up and actually have to use the mouse even less. Very cool. And that's all done over a USB or I guess Bluetooth even um, mixer. Right. You could do Bluetooth or USB, but um, it's it's always usually preferred when it comes to audio signal. The when you're when you're when you're at the desk to have that plugged in as much as possible. Yeah, uh, absolutely. So has Thunderbolt done much at all? Like, are there Thunderbolt mixers, or is USB C and USB kind of where things are at this point? Well, the greatest thing about Thunderbolt, what it, what it really gave us as far as a music pro- uh, producer's point of view, is the is just the speed of you know putting in a hard drive. Yeah. So we can now transfer all of our our files so much faster. We can transfer uh, because um, we have a lot of samples, a lot of music samples that we use in our uh, that we purchase separately to put inside of our uh, little bits of music to be able to uh, create other uh, larger music projects with. We call those samples, and we have uh, usually music producers have terabytes of uh, of samples, mm-hmm. and I'm no different in that regard. So the ability to have have uh, that Thunderbolt to be able to copy and uh, samples or large projects uh, even faster than before. It's been really great. So for for most for music producers, I think it was mostly been a speed transfer thing uh, uh, as far as how we experienced the Thunderbolt. Okay. And then something I'm curious about, uh, secondary iPads, is that something you've played around with? And does, does any soft music production software deal with using a primary iPad and maybe a control iPad as a secondary kind of touch a screen below your yeah. iPad. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So there's something called, there's a, a protocol called Ableton Live uh, created by the Ableton Live DAW. And what this protocol does is it allows any app to sync with each other and it doesn't and over over Wi-Fi. So what that means is I could have multiple iPads. I could have one iPad using one app, uh, let's say a drum app, playing mm-hmm. a drum loop, and then I could have another iPad uh, synced with that in real time, synced to the BPM, playing playing a melody over it. And then you can have unlimited devices hooked up. So I could have an iPad or another iPad, two iPads, or I could have one iPad and um, a... Um, um, a, 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 a hardware, a piece of hardware like a, uh, let's see, a MPC. I could have an MPC, an M- like for example, an MPC live device. I could have that hooked up to an iPad, or I could just have a desktop, a Mac or a PC mm-hmm. uh, hooked up via Ableton Live. So you can sync anything you want now with Ableton Live. So you could have oh, you can have an iPhone hooking up with your iPad, or, and the the possibilities kind of are endless. So if you Google uh, Ableton li- uh, Ableton Link, you'll see that that's how now every app. Every app inside of iOS supports, every music app uh, supports this thing called Ableton Link. And with that, you can the possibilities become endless because you can sync to other apps within the iPad and other devices all wirelessly. And Cubasis 3 supports this protocol? Absolutely. Uh, and it's funny because Cubasis 3 only recently uh, supported this particular protocol because you didn't really need it per se with Cubasis 3 because m- when you're in Cubasis, you're mostly just inside of Cubasis. Yeah. You know, you bring all of your plugins with the AUV3 standard in there. So um, it wasn't really a big thing for me, but I think it's really cool to now to be able to just have a ton of other apps or be able to sync Cubasis with uh, with my friend's Cubasis or sync Cubasis with a desktop uh, and, and and create create that way. So yeah, it's been, it's been really great. People have been very happy with the recent update that allows Ableton Live in side of Cubasis. And this is free or is this a subscription within Ableton to do this? So Ableton Link is an absolutely free protocol that developers build into their app. That's so it's cool. an SDK. That's awesome. Yeah, it's a programming SDK. Yep. Very cool. And then um, something I'm curious about, Dolby Atmos is something that 
has hit the music scene with spatial audio and Apple Music, and uh, I think others will probably adapt this as well. Can you mix and preview that audio on an iPad in any, in any way these days? So I so Cubasis doesn't support spatial audio <laughs> yet. Okay. Um, that is a pretty amazing thing that's still kind of new. Of course, audio files are just all over, you know, all over for it, um, all over the moon for it, because you do get this completely 3D, you know, yeah. uh, place that you can put audio in now. Which is which is on paper sounds amazing, but when you think of just producing music, I don't know if I need like some kind of synth going on the top of my head or like I some love kind it of crazy. for um, film soundtracks <laughs> but, that are yeah, mixed. Stuff, it's, it's, they're they're yeah, already film. mixed in a room environment like you would for exactly. a soundtrack. That that those orchestral stuff film it, and see, jazz film can do really as well interesting, does a yeah. great job with it. Oh, interesting, yeah. So you could definitely do uh, interesting stuff. I always thought it was very, what's far more interesting for film than music. But there's definitely some music producers out there, some audiophile music producers out there that are excited about it. I mean, but Dark in, Side in of the Moon is an experience if done right. <laughs> <laughs> true true yeah uh and that that's true and that was even that was just stereo <laughs> yeah so, well yeah i, I remember even... the 5.1 mix back um with the sa cds i had those back in the day and oh, that, that kind of yes. stuff where it, the it going behind you and stuff was just uh yeah the behind you that's that's what 5.1 introduced was the going behind you yeah and that is cool um that is definitely cool for music for sure but i nobody really took advantage everybody like literally every music producer 99 percent of them still producing stereo absolutely uh, stereo yeah. and, stereo and mono in fact we have to test everything in mono because most clubs uh their stereo speaker system is mono um uh, yeah, so, yeah in it, the old days very, very interesting you'd have had people with the iPod headphones and just have one in their ear. These days, <laughs> at least you have AirPods where just you just have one in and it's mono by default. But I remember the old days where I was listening to a podcast and I couldn't hear half the conversation because they didn't mix it in mono. No, oh yeah. goodness. But yeah, let's It's been a days. fun experience. It's been a fun experience over the years. That and the loudness wars. Uh, yeah. If you're familiar with that, that was a pretty oh, yeah. interesting a lot thing. Of mixes uh, that just are, <laughs> were awful and ruined. Yes, yeah. like a decade's worth. But yeah. yeah. So um so it's out there today. I know it's like probably Logic Pro is the only place you can probably do that on on the Mac like it's a new thing as you said. Yeah, I would assume Logic supports it. Um, as yeah, far as outputting so. three like is it even possible to output that kind of audio to speakers on an iPad through USB? Yeah. Is that so as far as I would assume the iPad does support like the protocol of spatial audio. So like if you downloaded a spatial audio file and played it back on your iPad and hooked that up to a spatial audio setup um, I th- well, I, or use the, the spatial audio um, headphones, yeah. um, you should be able to support. Yeah, you should yeah, be able no to hear that. No problem. Yeah, those definitely work because I have the whatever AirPods Max. So, yeah, I was curious about yeah, it. Yeah, so there you go. So the, works, the operating so. system supports it, okay, but, but yeah. there's no software uh, music plugins that I'm aware of uh, on iOS yet that support that. Okay, yeah. That'll be fun to just play around with when that eventually comes in some way. I you bet. Because I don't know. That just be I, that that just be fun to play with. Even if you're not a music producer, let me just play with audio around. Well, the head. There, and music produce. Uh, there's already plugins for music producers where you can visually um, set set instruments. So you can, for example, like set instruments really far away, push it really far away, or push it really uh, really close or really behind you. So you can kind of already that's like cool. do a spatial thing, but it's only like you know two D within stereo, it's not three yeah. D. So there's plugins exactly. for Cubasis so, that let you. Uh, basically sit people on the stage yes absolutely what's a good one of that so let's see uh virtual room okay virtual room is a good ios auv3 plugin that supports that uh vi- the, again you can do this with with any plugin but uh there's very few that support the visual aspect of it where you literally drag around and that uh virtual room i believe is the only one that i know of where you can see visually where you put the sounds otherwise you just kind of have to know based on the um um the stereo width and the frequencies yeah. that you're using. Okay. So if I wanted to have like a six person round table podcast, I could do a crazy mix. With that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, for sure. That's cool. When you're done mixing and you're done exporting everything, uh, is there a way to get your music on the Spotify or Apple music on an iPad? Um, is that do you have to work with a label to get stuff up there? Can independents do that easily now? What's that look like? Yeah. So the, the, the ability to kind of, um, uh, get your own music out there has been drastically reduced now to just a few different services, like um, like thirty dollars a month services. So, for example, DistroKid would be the one I'd recommend for most folks uh, that are, that are independent artists that that uh, you just pay a monthly fee and you can upload uh, as much tracks as you want to their service, and then they um, push it everywhere that you need, Spotify and every service that that's imaginable. Oh, cool. So there's 
Um, yeah, and it keeps track with the record labels and everything. You give them a PRO and everything so that they know exactly your ID and who you are and everything. And so uh, it's, it used to, you know, you used to have a label to do that. But now it's just brought down to a service for 30 bucks a month that anybody can do. And they, I believe they have an app. Um, but if not, you could just like push it to Dropbox and then push that up to, to, to or do it via the web browser as well. Um, it just, it's just a web browser. Yeah. In that model, it's 30 bucks and they don't take a percentage of sales or do they also take percentage of sales on top of that? So it's a good, so, so it's a good question. I, I I believe, I forget if it's, um if they take a percentage or not. I know it's really small if they do. Okay. It's like 1% if they, if they do. It's really, really, really small, but I don't believe that they do yeah. for the $30 a month because that was DistroKid's whole thing is uh, is that. So uh, I, I think it takes longer to get your stuff up, but you absolutely um don't get penalized for anything and uh, I don't believe they take any percentage. That's awesome. Yeah, because if you, if you sell at least thirty dollars worth of music in a month. That's a not bad deal. You bet. Yeah. Um, any other notable apps outside of Cubasis three that are worth mentioning in this audio production scene? Absolutely. So uh, Cubasis isn't the only DAW on iOS. There's actually a couple other DAWs, and you know we're definitely looking forward to the major DAWs like Logic eventually, hopefully coming down. Um, but there's absolutely GarageBand for sure on the iOS, on the iPhone and iPad. And it is a fantastic app. And there are some amazing YouTube channels that uh, with over 100K subs that are dedicated to this thing that have tutorials and everything you can think of. Uh, so GarageBand, of course, have to mention that. But then there's a couple other DAWs uh, as well, like um, BeatMaker 3. That's a big one. Uh, that's kind of an MPC type of layout. So if you're an older, old, more of an old school music producer used to the hardware stuff like MPCs, uh, that layout might be more for you, more of a sampler style layout. And uh, then there is um, Roland has a version, uh, has their own DAW called Roland Zen Beats. And that's a really great iOS DAW as well. And that hooks up to the Roland Zen Cloud. So you can actually play all of the Roland instruments that used to only be available on desktop. You can actually play that within their DAW now on iOS. So that's another major competitor. So you got Cubasis, Beat Maker 3, Zen Beats. Um, oh, and then um, Nano Studio 2 is also another popular uh, iOS DAW. So those are the kind of the big four that, that people produce music in on the iPad. Very cool. And then is there any non-music work you do on the iPad? And is it like it is your primary computer for other stuff as well? It, it's kind of funny because it, I mean, I, I don't think you, you probably can't see, but I, I, I have a whole studio like dedicated to the, with big, with big, you know, yellow speakers yeah. and everything. Um, all these hardware devices all sits around the, the, this little iPad that's right <laughs> in the center of the desk. You know, it's kind of funny, but yeah. that's, uh, I, I do every, it's funny because I, I, when I say I only do music with the iPad, it's, it's a little bit of an understatement because I have all of this hardware hooked up to it, you know, and all of these apps to be able to do that and, and all of these standards that Apple has developed to be able to do that. And it gets really intricate. But yes, I actually only um, use the iPad mainly for uh, music production. Again, because of that, it all started with that simplicity workflow where there was no driver configuration. There was no software configuration. There was no dongle, hardware dongle I had to plug in anywhere. There was no um, just crazy configuration. It was just download, add a track. Start, you don't miss start, the start, uh, start hardware serial number authenticator dongles. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Like all that crazy stuff. It gets really, really crazy. Like I said, like I encourage you, Tim, go check out what Cubase looks like on the desktop. It's crazy. So yeah. uh, to be able to have um, that, that, that just everything works right now when you need it uh, workflow that iOS uh, supports with, with its app store and, and it's iOS and, and you know, the code itself. Um, I just fell in love with it. And so I, I continue to stick with it and I continue to teach, uh, I continue to only use the iPad for music production. I continue to only teach uh, music production on the iPad because uh, uh, it's just there's no other experience anything like it. So I don't actually do anything else on the iPad but but make music. Okay. Even though it can do so so many things, it's yeah. it's amazing. If we edit 4K video these days and Luma Fusion, uh, and have uh, all these amazing photos and like the Lightroom version on iOS, iOS Lightroom version, uh, just uh, endless possibilities. Um, I actually started. I got my very first iPad. There, I, I didn't get, get get a chance to tell the origin story <laughs> of how I yeah. of how I got a, of how I got on the iPad, but just really briefly. I, I got my very first iPad, uh, which was an iPad mini, just for playing games. I wanted to see what the gaming scene was like, because I am a gamer, uh, yeah. and that's where the, the term Vortex comes from. It's, it's my gamer tag. And I uh, wanted to check it out. I'm like, there's got to be games. This gaming scene, I think, is kind of big on this iPad thing, so I'm going to get this iPad mini. And I downloaded, uh, uh, it was like 
Christmas of holiday 2012, and I downloaded a synthesizer app. I down, I'm like, what the heck? There's a synthesizer on the iPad? So I'm like, no yeah. way. So I downloaded it, checked it out, and sure enough, it was a full-on synthesizer, complete with hundreds of presets, can make any type of sound that you'd think. Uh, it has wavetables, all these crazy features. And uh, after that, I fell in love with... with Because uh, I always thought that you would need a Star Trek type of studio. Right. You know, you always think of the big speakers and the big mixing desk and all that stuff. I always thought that's what you needed to make music. I, never, I knew music... I wanted to do music one day, but I didn't ever imagine in a million years that I'd be able to do it with this little tiny device and uh, it was a life-changing experience and a very visceral moment i remember when i when i saw that it actually took me back to like like just sitting on my dad's lap and him playing the guitar for me as a kid like that type of just you kind of feel like connected you know like uh with everything and that's what i felt when i when i first downloaded that synth and i knew i was hooked after that so i just started learning everything i could about music production uh based from the ipad very cool so tell me a bit more about your site mobile music pro and kind of what what resources do you have available there? Yes, sir. So uh, basically, uh, again, Mobile Music Pro is kind of a combination of a YouTube channel and a sample pack label. And what that means is that um, it's an education company and a sound design company. So what I do is I want to sell courses and have a bunch of tutorials, uh, as free tutorials and free tutorial videos and guides. But then I also want to offer uh, sound design tools like uh, for producers, like such as MIDI packs and sample packs and preset packs. And cut, so to be able to get the, the producer started, uh, especially new producers, as soon as possible and so i have things on there to help you with music theory i have chord packs uh that helps you with music theory and and uh, teaches you chords and chord progressions and then i have an actual q basis guide that just teaches you q basis and then i like i said we have a ton of products on there um for sound design products like sample packs melody packs and uh drum packs and other things so basically what a new producer can do i mean uh, if they're just starting out to music like i got them covered they can they yeah. can go to the website they can download the guide learn the da then they can download a bunch of uh, uh, uh midi packs and learn music theory and then they can download a bunch of sounds and sample packs and have their production sounding just as good as the radio so i really kind of try to take you from start to to, to at least intermediate uh, and eventually I'm going to be working on advanced stuff as well but right now uh, the channel is mostly focused on newer uh, producers people just starting to get into making music cool and how involved is the iPad itself in creating the website the t videos and guides and stuff or is that something you still offload uh, to the Windows computer to kind of create the actual website itself yeah so absolutely so like I said the only thing I actually use the uh, iPad and iPhone for is, is music production so everything else which includes video editing graphic design um, you know uh streaming um all that kind of stuff goes through a pc gotcha. so I, I i usually use the adobe suite mm -hmm. um for for all of that so photoshop and uh, premiere are my main tools that i'm that i'm mostly in for the channel to be able to uh create all the the videos and create all the graphics gotcha. and all cool. the marketing and all that yeah the adobe apps still have a long way to go on ipad <laughs> <laughs> yes so they're getting there though. yeah they definitely are and you also start a podcast mobile music roundtable and kind of is, is a show for people that want to learn how to get into doing what you do yeah so basically it's for anybody that's kind of curious about making music on the ipad or the iphone you know so anybody who's curious about making music and, and maybe and specifically making music on their ios device so that i bring on for example app developers music app developers i bring on the show uh to kind of get their story i bring on uh, ios music producers uh, ios musicians uh basically anybody who's f uh, focused on doing something or moving the space forward in the music production um ecosystem specifically the ios music production ecosystem system so i i have um content creators on there as well for, uh, that, that's specifically focus on ios music production on their youtube channel uh people like uh doug the from the sound test room and uh jade star and jamie malander and a bunch of these uh content creators that focus on making um content around music on the ipad so yeah it's actually a bunch of different people on there i, I just started that recently uh the, the whole channel all of mobile music pro only started in november of 2019 so it's only a couple years old but i only started the actual podcast about six months or so yeah. we're about to do our sixth Looks episode new, yeah. yeah and we do one of those a month so i try to bring on multiple people and have a conversation that's why i call it a round table because i kind of want everybody to be able to jump in at any time and uh, have the keep the conversation very organic nice Anything else you want to touch on before we wrap it up? Yeah, so uh, a big part, the only thing, the only other thing I'd say is that uh, a big part of what Mobile Music, Pro, uh, Mobile Music Pro does is contests. We put on these contests every few months or so to encourage producers, specifically newer producers, to start creating content and start creating music. And so uh, we just, you know, we, we have one every couple of months. We just had one that went from March 2nd to March 22nd. And it was our biggest one yet because it was over uh, $500 worth of prizes that went home to uh, four uh, top winners there. So, and that is voted upon by the community. 
So it's really great. So uh, you, you get a chance to make some music and then get a chance to maybe win some money. And really what I think the most important thing is you get other people a chance to be able to hear your music. And that's what uh, producers really, uh, I found, have really responded to. Very cool. Well, thank you so much for your time tonight. It's been great chatting with you and learning more about this scene. I'm just very interested in and uh, thank you so much you bet Tim it really is a huge scene like it's a, it's a whole scene so I'm absolutely happy to to represent some of those people and uh, some of the content that we've been talking about there and it's, it's just a fun time fun community the uh, Facebook groups the audio bus forum uh, shout out to all those people and yeah shout out to uh, anybody making music on the iPad well that was my conversation with Vortex my thanks to him for his time recording my thanks to you for your time and attention tuning in as a reminder you can support the show by downloading Agenda 14 which is now available Learn more at agenda.com. You can also support the podcast over at patreon.com slash iPad pros or by subscribing in Apple podcasts. With that, I'll talk to everyone again real soon. <laughs>